Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Tuesday night in the spotlight. Tonight, I have joining me Erin Chandler. After the death of her youngest daughter and struggling with deep grief, depression, PTSD, and lack of support systems, she found herself in the middle of the forest making the decision to end her life. But then something miraculous happened that changed her life forever. She discovered that her daughter was very much with her and that there was a way to learn how to communicate with her daughter and other deceased loved ones through psychic mediumship. Through work with the bereaved and blossoming mediums, Erin accesses intuitive information and guidance of the highest levels to facilitate healing on multiple levels from grief, loss, and trauma. Going one step further, she teaches others how to tap into their own spiritual guidance and how to communicate with their loved ones. Chandler has dedicated her life to helping others to move through grief more easily and teaching them how to connect with spirit, just as she and her clients have been able to do. As a bestseller on Amazon, the author of Love You Ava Baby and The Spirit Connection, Erin shares the highs and lows of trauma, grief, and loss, as well as the spiritual guidance and tools that she has used to overcome and transform transform her loss into passion, purpose, and peace. Both books can be found on Amazon and Love You Ava Baby is available online at select bookstores across North America. For private readings, workshops, or to order a love letter from Spirit, you can visit Erin's website at www.erinchandler.com. Connect with her on Facebook at There Is Life After Losing a Child or visit her on Instagram at The Grief Spirit Connection. And I'll have those links up for you guys after. So thank you so much, Erin, for joining me here tonight. So can you tell me, how did this whole kind of process go? Like, how did you step into the work that you're doing now? Yes. Well, first off, thank you for having me here, Catherine. Yeah, absolutely. To um, share and just spread awareness of different avenues that people have that maybe they aren't aware of, especially when they're in the thick of grief. So it started with the death of my youngest daughter and that ultimately catapulted me into the darkest places. That's the one thing everybody, nobody wants to lose a child. Nobody wants to think about losing a child. Nobody yeah. wants to really, doesn't know what to do around somebody who has lost a child. It's very uh, taboo. It's very isolated and it's very alone. So as a quick synopsis, um, because it's a long story, for seven years after the death of my daughter, I was not able to grieve. So it was very tamped down. Every time that I, it came up, people would um, turn away, tell me to focus on positive things, it just not allowing me to do it. So it got to the point where it just permeated in the body. I became very disconnected. I had dissociative disorder. I was diagnosed with um, complex PTSD and it just progressed. So I started, my health started declining. Nobody could figure out why until the point that I couldn't get out of bed and I couldn't work. Um, I really was not able to parent my children very effectively. And uh, it totally annihilated my relationship with my spouse because he too was struggling in grief and had no support systems either. So it really was a big mess. It really was a destruction of all of the foundations um, of our lives. Mm -hmm. And typically when you lose a child, that is kind of the norm, not the specifics, but in, in any grief, that's the norm. It blows away foundations. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of it is, is they're not foundations that uh, are meant to be part of your whole foundation. And I think that's the part where we get disconnected. So what happened was, is I got to the point where, you know, I had no spouse. I was so sick. Nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. I was so tired. I hadn't grieved. I was trying to look after two other children and I just was not okay. So I went to the middle of the forest and um, I, yeah, I, I surrendered. I said, I give up and I made the decision I was going to end my life. And then the pivotal point for me was when I actually surrendered surrender to trying to figure it out and like grappling every day once I surrendered and did that within a couple of days a woman that I know called me and knew everything that was going on and I had told no one about some pieces of this um, mm -hmm. and she said those exact words she says I'm hearing that you gave up and your daughter is saying you absolutely cannot give up 
it's not your time. You have to figure out how to do this. So literally a medium saved my life. Wow. I would not be here today if it was not for that woman who went totally out of her comfort zone, out of the blue, not knowing if any, any of it was accurate. She literally saved my life and that is powerful. And that's part of the reason I share my story um, because a lot of people in grief are faced with living half a life. So what happened from there was the second I realized that my daughter was still alive and around me in spirit, I wanted to live. I wanted to get better. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be there for my other children. That was literally the thing that I needed to keep going. Um, for a lot of people in grief, it's hard to keep going every day. It's hard when you're you're grappling with that darkness and the waves of emotions and things like that, especially in isolation. So ultimately that put me on a whole journey, Catherine, of not only learning how to connect with her, which was how it started out. It was a slow process. And that's one of the things we'll probably talk about today is how that process looks. Uh, but also being able to teach that to others it all, as soon as I started working with others, trying to help them with grief, initially, I was like, oh, I want to get rid of their grief. But as I progressed along with it, and as more and more people's children and spouses and husbands and fathers and brothers and you name it, started coming in, um, the story became very, very clear. It was not about, you know, I don't feel grief anymore. It was actually about embracing what grief actually is, not what we're taught it is. So it's, it's been quite a journey, <laughs> to now, say the least. Can I ask, what would your experience with grief be in embracing grief versus what we're taught it is? Because I know for myself, for a lot of clients, it's, I need to get through this. I need to get over this. I need to stop grieving. It's been five years. It's been 10 years. And to me, grief is just, it's a journey that you're just always on. Mm -hmm. So I like to separate it. So I look at it as, when we think about grief, we think about all the emotions that come with it. So anger, shame, guilt, regret, blame, um, loss, all of those things, we lump into one little word called grief. Yeah. But if you look at the concept, grief is really just love. It is literally the full spectrum. If you want to know how much you loved someone when they die, that's when you really realize the depth and the breadth of their love. It really is a full circle. So I like to separate it. If grief is just love, I'm more willing to open up my tears. I'm more willing to feel all the things that come with it. And in addition to that, I've separated the anger, the shame, the blame, and the regret. Because when we think of, you know, if somebody betrays you in a marriage, we look at betrayal, but really betrayal has all those emotions too. When you look, it's true. Any situation has all those emotions in, with it. So we've been taught that grief is all of these bad things. Why on earth are we going to want to go there? Why would we do that? We fight it because we're like, oh, it's going to feel bad. For a lot of bereaved parents, they don't want to go there because it's like, what if I never come out of there? Yes. And that is a scary place. Not realizing that in that darkness is where everything lights up when you can honor and embrace it and say, you know what, this is just love. And I'm going to let myself feel it regardless of the emotions that literally allows you to go through that process. When I, you know, I cry when <laughs> Catherine, I cry when I laugh, I cry when um, I'm sad. I cry when my kids do something amazing. Tears <laughs> are literally an expression of such beauty. Yeah. But we've put grief in this little box of don't talk about it. We don't want to make them cry. It feels bad. Don't go there. And if you're not over it, then you're doing it wrong. So we think, Oh, we're doing it wrong. Tamp that down, paste a smile on our face and go about our day. And that sinks us. It's literally the most, uh, when I think about grief, I think there is no human being that will never go through loss of a loved one. Yes. So why are we not talking about it? Why are we not supporting each other? Why are we not giving each other the tools that we need and the shoulder to cry on and all that jazz? Like, why is this, why is this not talked about? Exactly. Life, death, and taxes. We talk about taxes all the time. We celebrate life all the time. But this third thing here is really important. And there Absolutely. is a reason, a spiritual reason for grief. Um, and I think that's one of the other things we'll probably touch on too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think what you're saying is so important because 
death of anybody is not something we can escape from. Yeah. It's whether it's we're gone first or someone else has gone before us, eventually all of our lives are touched by death in some way, shape or form. So why aren't we talking about it? You're a hundred percent right on. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you believe then is the purpose of grief for us on a human experience and also as a soul growth or a soul purpose of it? So my understanding, both from the information that I get from spirit, guides, angel, um, God, all those types of things, um, in addition to working with clients and people going through the grief process, both through, uh, through my program where it's intimate um, on a consistent basis, even in just in medium readings, my understanding having come through the process of grief to a point where I am grateful for the loss of my daughter. So to get to, for somebody to say that, it's scary for me to say that to you. And the reason it's scary for me to say that is who would ever think that they would be thankful or grateful for that kind of a loss? Um, so can I just interrupt you for yeah. one second? So I started on my journey after my father passed away and yeah. same idea of, I was 16 when he passed and it was years of this deep gutting heartache that I was just carrying with me, but it was through the connection with him that I opened up to my gifts. And I'm so grateful now that he passed Yes, because it opened me up to something so much bigger, so much bigger. And that's the same. That is literally the same story, just in a different context. Right. Yeah. That is the piece that allowed me to come through to all this. I wouldn't be sharing her story. I wouldn't be talking about grief. Um, I wouldn't be doing what literally is my life purpose. Yeah. That was the catalyst. Um, do I think about her every day? Absolutely. Do I cry and laugh and smile and talk to her all the time? Absolutely. Um, and I am eternally grateful. So for me, that's, that's a really good outlay because it is hard to hear, oh, I'm thankful for that loss. It's almost like, oh, it goes against everything we've ever been taught, feel, goes against all of those things. That's why it's so scary to come out and say that. Um, for me, it literally was the gift of myself. That was the gift that she gave me. Mm. It is breaking, the purpose of grief is to fully open your heart up and to break down all the layers that do not work, that are not true, that are illusions to allow you to become into more of yourself, to find real joy, not you know the societal construct or institutional concept that we are taught that you're supposed to be happy. It eliminates all those things. It gives you freedom, it gives you peace. And for me, that was like, taken off the shackles it really was and I think for a lot of people once they come to the realization that their loved ones are there and they can see them hear them feel them know them all the time it changes everything just like you Catherine it sparks a whole new journey when you're willing to allow it to so if we're not willing to look at the grief piece and we're struggling to do it in the mainstream type of way Sometimes we don't get to that thing until we surrender. So you'll notice I spent seven years in that mainstream. It yep. didn't work until I surrendered. And it was like, oh, here I am. <laughs> yeah, so it's really quite um, fascinating. And the thing about it is grief in a sense, it really, I welcome it. And I welcome it because it acknowledges that I'm going through change. Everything is changing in life. Nothing will ever stay the same. And grief is a real acknowledgement to that. It is um, really drawing on your soul to come out of itself. It's asking you to look for more. It's asking for you to be more authentic. And it's also asking you to forgive yourself. Grief is a lot of it is about self forgiveness. And I feel like um, we struggle with that. Absolutely. We have all these layers of constructs. Um, so when we tie into the spiritual awakening piece of it, it's this kind of ties in, I guess you could say in the concept of mindset, because through my experiences and through teaching others and through mentors of my own, your mindset is everything. 
literally, it, it really is everything. It can be your greatest tool or it can be your worst enemy. Yep. And as we go about our life, we're layered with all of these experiences, people, relationships, um, institutions, religions, like you name it. Um, grief allows us to be able to explore the brilliant cover-up that we inherently don't know what's best for us, that mm. we inherently don't have the answers, um, that you need to listen to what somebody else is saying outside of you because that's how you validate. So grief allows us to look at that. And I feel like that's where a lot of people struggle, both in learning when they're learning to connect, tapping into their stuff um, and through the grief process. Because literally, I, when I look at it, it really is the most brilliant cover up when you think about it to tell, to teach us from a very young age through our ancestors who are also compounding, because that's all they were taught to yes. is, you know, be afraid of it. It's associated with the devil. Um, you have no scientific proof, uh, whether you feel it or not is irrelevant because we don't see it out here. I, I remember when I was really sick, I knew that if someone didn't figure out something was wrong, I was literally dying. My body from the inside out was eating itself. So in the medical community, it was like, well, it's not off the charts here and it's not off the charts here. Yeah, your liver looks like this. Yeah, your blood works, you know, it's off here. Yeah, you clearly have an issue, but we don't know what it is. So it's not uncommon for a doctor to say, you know, take a antidepressant. Oh, her child died, take an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. But I knew, I was like, no, my body is, it is failure to thrive. It was failing to thrive. So the interesting part about that is, is when I stopped looking at what the medical system was telling me, because I started to believe it. And not only did I start to believe what they were telling me that was all in my head, maybe I needed an antidepressant, people in my extended family and my sp my spouse started to believe it too, saying, maybe this is all in your head. And no, something medically is wrong with me, whether all of you don't see it or not. Yeah. And that's a, that's, you know, that's an internal, but really our constructs that we're taught is, is you should be paying attention to this. And if you don't fall in line with that box, or if you don't meet this criteria, or if this science hasn't proven that, then we're not really going to acknowledge you and you're going to be discredited. And I think a lot of people go through that, whether it's medical, whether it's schooling, whether it's religion, um, depression is very unseen. And that's another thing that, um, because we don't see it, that's why we have such a dilemma. Um, it's more than a dilemma. I'm saying that word very, very lightly. Um, when it comes to suicide, um, depression, trauma, PTSD, all those things is because it's unseen. Yeah. And the people who are outside of us trying to give us diagnoses and helping us, they don't acknowledge the internal piece of it. And that stops our growth. So when you talk about spiritual waking, like when I stop and I think about it, Catherine, uh, you know, I could talk, I could talk all night long about all the things that went wrong. Yeah. Um, but in truth, each of them had a very, very specific purpose. The key for me to understanding the purpose and figuring out why all that was was one, making sure that I felt safe. If I didn't feel safe, I wasn't going to explore the emotion. I wasn't gonna cry about it. And I certainly wasn't going to explore or even be able to figure out what that underlying thing is. Yeah. And that's why in grief, we have to have a community. We've forgotten that. We really have. And it's so sad because when you think about the outlay of grief for a human being, when you lose somebody, and we don't get the help we need it grief manifests it's an emotional psychological response and it manifests in our body so that means we have extreme taxing on the healthcare system we have um, potentially the outcome of dysfunctional relationships which stem down to our children who are the next generation the way this all lays out if somebody goes out in the world and they're not able to process grief it's like trickles to everyone around them. It, it touches everything. So why, why wouldn't we talk about that? And, you know, connecting really was, for me, it was the be all and end all. It's the reason why I can tap into the psychological components. It's the reason why people have readings with me and they feel better afterwards because they've been able to have that connection and have understanding and know that it is real. So mm. I look at it as if I have a feeling in my heart and I look at you, Catherine, and I say, I love you with all my heart. And I feel that in my heart. 
why do I need somebody outside of me to tell me that that's true? Yes. And that's what we're taught. Yes. Don't trust yourself. Um, you don't know what's right for you. And there's so many layers of that. Grief really is, if you allow it to be, the unraveling of all that, the coming home to yourself and being in full connection with your loved ones. It's the best thing ever. Honestly, it is it's the feeling of knowing that my daughter's beside me or she's saying something. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. To have that experience, yeah. it, it's elation. It, I, it feels incredibly safe. Yeah. I feel that it allows me to move in the world. It allows me to help other people. And it allows me to feel joy because at the end of the day, we don't die. Our body dies, but we don't inherently die. I am forever. You are forever. And we fear death. We are taught to fear death. And it, you know, we have to have a different conversation about this. When I die, I don't want my kids to suffer and struggle with regret and shame and blame. I literally want my children to grow up and know that when I cross over and it's my time that I am talking to them all the time. Yeah. I want them to know how to look for the signs and messages. I want them to know that I'm crying with them. I'm feeling everything with them so that they can thrive. Yes. And everyone who's passed before us is saying that to us. That is their message. We want you to thrive. We were with you. Like, let's do this. I got you. But our social constructs and the things we taught really eliminate that for us. Mm -hmm. So. And you know, it's so interesting because when you actually talk to people who have experienced grief in some way or another, everybody always goes, I know I got a sign in this way, or I know I got a sign in this way. And the more you talk about it and the more people see that these signs are actually happening, they're not going crazy or anything like that. It, it's, there's so much more comfort that comes in it and we don't need proof. I know w w after my father had passed, there were certain signs that were coming forward. And at first I'm like, am I, am I going crazy? Like, is this really a sign right now? And it's, I mean, here we are 21 years later and it's still the same signs that he's sending me. So I know he, you're around, you're around, you're around, you know? And again, it's, it's about that conversation with people, that connection with other people. It is. And you know, what's so fascinating. I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, a lot of people, when we get signs, we doubt it. Yes. Despite the fact of knowing in that moment, this is what it is, we then we our brain kicks in for all those layers of things that we are taught. And yeah. that's part of the reason why we did it because we don't trust ourselves, or we haven't really opened up that journey enough for us to be like, no, I know that. And it really is fascinating. And, you know, talking about getting signs and spirits and mediums and psychics and all that stuff is also taboo. So I feel like it's an added layer. So I always find um, when I'm talking to bereaved parents, it's like this subject that they know they can only talk to certain people about. When I go into this room, I will never talk about this because it's not safe. They'll think I'm crazy. I might lose my job. Like the list goes, it is it blows my mind. So the, the sim, one of the tools are people who are channels that have this God given access to help you. And it's a secret. And not only is this a secret, but our social, you know, TV, all of those things, movies, like we're taught that, you know, they're not for real. They're fortune tellers. They're flaky. They're this, they're that. And oh I'm God, thinking, they're just scamming your money. Yeah. <laughs> like that whole jazz. Do you know how many people are less have said to me, I trust you, Aaron, but some of them are charlatans and it stops me because I think to myself, then you don't understand what we do because you know, at the end of the day, when, when everyone goes to, um, goes for a reading to a medium or goes to see a psychic or goes to see something to that effect. If they can go without that label, they'll understand that we're actually feeling their emotions for them. We're bringing, we, we hold space for people in their most vulnerable, for people in their saddest points of their life. Sometimes they give them guidance towards their happiest or validation, which way to go. To have that discredited in such a way in mainstream, it's become a fabric of, 
you know, it's become a piece of the fabric of our life that it's not to be trusted. So I always think to myself, it's fascinating to me that one of the greatest tools, everyone is an intuitive. It's not just you and me. Every single human being was born with access to the tool of their intuition, whether it's claircognizance, clairsentience, um, clairvoyance, and all the other clairs. We all have access to them. Mine isn't going to look like yours. No. I would have to be you and lived your life. Yes. And that's where people get hung up, right? We, we look at it being done one way and we think, oh, it's supposed to look this way. Not realizing that we have our own specific skills that's unique to us. And when we're willing to delve in and tap into that, it allows us to see our own magic and have that connection. If I could learn to do this, because that's what I did. I didn't just, you know, I haven't been hearing dead people my whole life. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, it, it all literally is learning and cultivating um, and doing those things like that, which I don't know if you want to talk about um, that specifically. No, absolutely. I was thinking about this conversation. Yeah. So, you know, learning to connect with spirit for me um, and for most of my clients really was a game of how do I explain this in a way that is the most beneficial for the most people? It's a game with yourself of trust, of doubt, of faith, and of being willing to walk where you've never walked before. So the Dalai Lama has this great um, quote, and I'm probably not going to quote it exactly. So he says, when you're talking, you're only talking about things that you already know. But when you listen, you just might hear, you hear things that you didn't already know. And that's how you learn. And that's not exactly his quote. You'll I know what quote you're referring to though. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and it's powerful because when I think, think about it here, I'm telling you things that I know because I've learned them through my experience, but how did I actually learn them? Through listening. Yeah. Listening to the quiet, listening to spirit, um, listening to things that open up that, that concept or those channels. Um, and not just listening, seeing, breathing, meditation, all that jazz. Yeah. So when you're learning to cultivate a connection with spirit, I always list it as compound interest. Compound interest can literally explain, explain anything that you wish to do. It is, it is literally the greatest tool. We look at it as finances. But when you're talking about spirit and you're talking about getting connections, you have to use compound interest. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to see if I can have a connection today and then leave it for a month or disconnect totally from meditation for two weeks and then get back in and expect everything to be crystal clear and on it. Yeah, no, it does not work, it does that, not way. work that way, right? Yeah. And, and the other thing too is some people will have this mind-blowing experience and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I saw my loved one. We had a conversation. I felt them. I heard them. I saw them the whole nine and then they try and get that experience over and over again yes and spirit doesn't work that way no nope. <laughs> willing to be like i'm ready I, whatever you want to give me i will receive it however you want to send it to me you have to be willing to receive it in the way that spirit sends it to you because we forget in our minds, we're like, oh, I got to figure out how to do this. And am I doing this? But spirit's like, no, we know how you need to receive it for you to get it. So let go of control and let us show you. But yeah. we can't let them show us if we're like, oh, I can do this. I got to do that. <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We get caught up in that. So compound interest. I always say a little bit each day will give you such a huge transformation. Um, for me, if I don't sit down for 10 minutes, whether it's to pull an Oracle card and journal on it, or to spend 25 minutes a day meditating, um, it could be sitting down and doing automatic writing through channeling through automatic writing. Um, whenever I do a medium reading, I literally sit down, I ground, I focus, I clear my energy, those are things that you need to do on a consistent basis. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like having a shower every day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You have to clear yourself, you clear your energy and just connect with yourself. Yeah. And it feels hard at first, right? Absolutely. It's like, oh my gosh, I got to get into this routine. For me, self-discipline was huge. 
I really struggled with that. And it took me a really long time to be consistent. And it wasn't until actually I figured out how much more that consistency opened up my connections. <laughs> Once I figured that out, it was like a light bulb went off. Oh, this is what I'm here. talking about. <laughs> right. Hold on here. <laughs> I get it. But getting into the groove of it, it's hard because we're dealing with our kids. We're dealing with our work. We're dealing with people around us. We're dealing with life in general. And especially right now, life is, there's a lot of chaos. I don't know about you and everyone else that's, that watches this, but being somebody who feels people's energy very sensitively, you feel a whole lot more. So we're feeling a lot of energy shifts right now. We're feeling the chaos. We're feeling the hurt and the pain, go through all of the stuff that is being really amplified about racism that's happening, whether it's indigenous, black, all of it, not to mention, you know, when the women's rights and movements and feminine divine power, we're feeling all of that stuff. So being able to when things are the most chaotic, that's the point we're supposed to slow down. And it's the last thing we do. At least for me, it was the last thing I did. I was like, no, I got to keep going. I got to keep doing it. I just have to get through this. When really what I actually needed to do was stop, breathe, meditate, reconnect. And when I do, it's like, I can filter that out. I can clear my energy. I can focus and I can hear spirit better. And everyone, um, people always think it's a gift. So I have a lot of people say, oh my gosh, you have such a gift. And I say, yes, I do. I have this beautiful gift where I can see, feel, hear, channel, um, could take you through guided sessions, do shamanic work if needed, whatever the scenario is. These are beautiful gifts and I am humbly grateful for them and I use them to serve others. But I'm also using them to tell other people that they have those gifts too. They're not the same. And we think we don't, we think they're gifts. And a lot of times the underlying thing is we don't feel we're worthy of gifts. We live in a society where we're not worthy. You're born in sin. You immediately right out of the gate. Sorry. And that makes people feel like they're not worthy of gifts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it builds so much fear oh, to step yeah. into those gifts. Cause even like the story of Jesus, yes. how his life ended in the end after doing all of this good work and everything. And so I feel like those types of stories make people go, I, I don't know if I can, I'm, I'm scared shitless right now yeah. to step into what this power is. Yeah. And you know, it's fascinating because a lot of people look at, a lot of people are turned off of religion because it's, because of how it's been conceptualized, how it's been spun, manipulated, people put their own spin on it. So when I say the word God, there is a million different references to yeah. how people view that. That doesn't necessarily mean that's how I'm saying it. It's just people's perception of it. And yeah. I feel like, um, you know, there's a lot of things for us to come together with. There's, there's people who say we didn't leave religion because we don't follow Jesus teachings or love or all those things. We left it because we know all this other stuff is not Jesus at all. It's just like, um, for, you know, at the risk of offending people it's really people taking things out of context it's a it's men who have written something and put their perception or spin on it and when you actually think about it what would happen if everyone in the world suddenly realized that they had a direct pipeline to god the universe and spirit what would happen we would no longer require all of these institutions we would no longer fund them yeah. um, we would have a way easier time of being able to figure out our own stuff and our own value without going outside of us in the social constructs and doing that. But it's been layered and taught to be afraid of it. Yeah. And some, a lot of people, it's so interesting, Catherine, um, you know, there's a lot of people who come to me and think, and the first thing you say is, do you, do you ground yourself and surround yourself in the light? Are you talking with God? And are you talking with angels? And I think to myself, spirit, spirit, God, angels, all those things, our love yeah. we're afraid of love and i want to tell you that you don't need to be because we think it's something else because we're taught that and it's such a such a disservice to ourselves you know and i always feel like awareness is key you know whether or not somebody believes me is irrelevant i don't need to convince anyone of this my story alone and the simple fact that i'm living it and doing it is proof enough for me 
I don't need anybody else to validate it. To have my clients say the same thing is proof enough for me too. And I feel like, you know, you're just planting the seeds of awareness, even that it is possible, that it's possible that your loved ones are there, that you can feel and hear them. That's enough for me, just for people to know that it's possible because it opens up all the doors. And I always feel like Catherine, everybody, everybody has this feeling, you know, when somebody's light shines, that it detracts from them. When the truth is, it's the opposite. When you shine your light, it's like everybody else gets to shine their light too. You're giving yeah. them permission. And we, that's another layer of things that we've been taught, right? Yeah. There's so many constructs of it. And I'm going on about this. That really wasn't what I was going to talk about tonight. But I, okay. really, I think it needs to be work. <laughs> It's, it, I think we all need to hear about this dismantling because I feel like 2020 has okay. really illuminated how much needs to be dismantled, how many systems have been in place that it, it's been absolutely mind blowing this year because there's been so many things where I'm like, I didn't even realize this was happening. I didn't realize that this was an issue still. Do you know what I mean? And so it's dismantling the belief systems within ourselves. Right. It's dismantling the feelings that we've kind of kept ourselves from feeling because it was too uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's dismantling the systems that are actually in place, you know, not just what our thoughts are, but all of it. And it's actually, it feels horrific, but it's actually a great thing. We need those things dismantled. We yeah. need to be totally aware of all of these injustices, in unfairness, like all of it. Yeah. The, when we become aware of it, that means we can change it. Like, it feels like the worst year ever for a lot of people. I get it. 2020, there, it's 2020, it's clear vision. Today is the 20th. October 10, 2020, 2020. I know. <laughs> it really is the year of the visionary, <laughs> which was a slogan for the Archangel community. And I love that because basically what we're seeing here is all the things that have never been working. They've yeah. never worked. And now we're becoming heightenedly amplified, aware that they're not working. Yeah. So as awful as, as this can feel it's scary because it's like when you pull things out of people's foundations that's what I went through all the foundations went out and you do you feel like you're drowning you don't know where to turn you don't feel safe it's so unknown and when I look at all the things that are being brought into um, the mainstream media being amplified of these things that aren't working and they are a problem I, th I thought to myself I said COVID for, you know, I hope that doesn't get taken off of, of Facebook because they're really censoring these days. No, actually, do you know what happens? As soon what? as you say COVID, the numbers on the live video go up. Oh. COVID or Trump. And the oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <Yeah. laughs> so when I look at COVID, this is a lesson in death and grief, and it is showing the mm. entire world why we are, how we are not doing it right. So as within, so without our Western culture, we isolate the bereaved. That's what we do, whether we're aware of it or not. COVID is just showing you outside that isolation. Now you understand that that's an issue. Mm. And in addition to that, it's bringing up our deepest fear, death. What's gonna happen if you get COVID? You might die. Yeah. You need to get vaccines for your children because you might die. You yeah. know, it really, when you pull, go all the way down to the base of it, it's using the fear of death to um, whether you believe in conspiracy theories, you're with it, you're not with it, it doesn't really matter. You are actually looking at not a virus, you're looking at your fear of death. Mm. That's the basis of it. Absolutely. And it's worldwide, right? Death yeah. does not discriminate. Um, so I feel like this is an opportune time to have a conversation. When it becomes highlighted that we're, we're grieving in isolation, we can't see our deceased loved ones, all of these things that are a very um, 3D concept, right? Yeah. When I when I see articles, Catherine, about people who are, you know, I don't get to be with my loved one and all those things, I literally sometimes want to shout from the rooftops, don't worry, no one, no one dies alone, ever. Yeah. All yeah. of their loved ones are there with them. You never have to worry about that. And if everyone knew that, it would really help them to be able to ease, go through the grief process and open up this channel, which it's ultimately intended to do is to connect you deeper to yeah. God, to spirit and to your loved ones. It's not meant to 
shut you up and don't feel bad. Yeah. That's, that's our um, societal way of dealing with it. And it's broken. It's always been broken. Let's be real. Absolutely. Just saying. Because <laughs> it, it is a very, grief itself is a very taboo subject. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many clients I've had that I've, I've got quite a few actually who want to write books called shit not to say to people in grief. Yes. It's like those, well, God has a plan. Everything happens for a reason and all of this, which is all absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But when you're in the depths of grief, the yep. last thing you want to hear is that you've lost your child because God has a greater plan for your child, you yeah. know? And even though I can see in hindsight, mm -hmm. how that has always come to light, mm -hmm. to me, it's not something we can be told. Exactly. It's something we need to experience. Exactly. And most people don't ever get to experience that if they're just following what the society is telling them to do. And you're so right. And I, I hope they do write books because the thing is, is people, you know, when I, I just wrote an article actually that touched on this for um, infant and pregnancy loss, mm. medium.com. And it, it really is about awareness. That's it. You know, I know that when you're telling me it's God's plan, I know, I know that you're not trying to make me feel worse that you're not trying to make it um the thing that you're saying isn't in alignment with what your actual intentions are yeah. but that's because we're not aware and the reason we're not aware is because nobody's talking about it yes and if we talk about it you know then guess what my neighbor down the street who watched one of my podcasts when they're other neighbor or somebody else passes away they're gonna know oh I shouldn't say that but I can just let them know I'm there for them um, I can do this and I can do that because it literally is just awareness it's not that we're pointing fingers and saying we're you're doing it wrong because a lot of people have shamed about that I did Catherine after I lost my daughter I when I thought about the things that I was taught about grief it was a real eye-opener mm. oh, it was it did not serve. It served to push people deeper into grief versus opening them up and allowing it. Mm -hmm. But I would never have known that because no one talks about it. They mm -hmm. say, don't talk to them. You might make them feel worse. You can't make me feel worse. I feel like this all the time when you're in grief, right? Like this is my norm and I want to cry about it. So like, you can't make it feel worse, but that's not what we're taught. And um, I really do it's such, it's such a healing conversation to have. We all lose people. And in effect, if you allow yourself to go through the process and if you allow yourself to open up to connections with them and, you know, a lot of people go all in when someone goes all in, like after the loss of a child, the parents that go all in Catherine, it's like a 180. And I, you know, I, sometimes I am in awe of the changes that have, I feel like crying when I actually think about it. Um, I never, ever could have imagined that somebody who's gone through that much trauma and that much loss and that much horrible things can turn around and be happy and connect and use it with purpose and have joy and thrive and be excited for life. Because that's what happens when you invite spirit into your healing purpose, into your healing journey, into that purpose of your grief is profound. And I, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, there is no way I ever could have thought about this stuff or put it together or controlled it. That was all spirit. Yeah. I just let them guide me. And I think to myself, if more people were aware that that is possible, then more people get to experience it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the way you talk about this, mm -hmm. like, even as you're sitting here speaking to me now, I'm like, I, I've never spoken to you before in my life. So I don't know actually what regular Aaron sounds like, but as you're speaking, it's like spirit is just speaking directly through you right now because the messages are just so on point. And I keep getting these like shivers of goosebumps over my body right now. That's like confirming everything that you're saying. So thank you so much for that. Oh, I'm so, so glad. That makes me happy. That was my, that's always my intention. Yeah. It's not mine. It's spirit. Whatever you want to channel, that's the best for everybody. 
free flow. I am yours. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, going back to this idea of what we say to people in grief, that sort of thing, what would you suggest as a person who's lost a child and also someone who's supporting so many others who have lost loved ones? What would you say is the best way for people outside of that grief to support someone? So that's a really, really great question because we can talk about all the things that don't work, but it's pointless if we don't talk about the things that do work. <laughs> so in my experience and just through most other people's experience, the number one thing you can do is listen without judgment, without trying to make it better, without trying to fix it, literally to just sit with someone and listen to them talk about it is so healing for them. That is one of the greatest gifts you can do. Um, the other thing is a lot of, I, for me, I found a lot of people, you know, said whatever you need. And that is initially, and they do mean that, but as we go through the grief process, um, it kind of people go on with their lives. Yeah. That's what it felt like everybody went on with their life. And as time went on, people didn't want to talk about it or they would avoid me afraid that I might talk about it. Mm. Um, and I always say the most, the most beautiful expressions, interactions and relationships that I have had are with people who have talked about grief. Mm. It really is. Or people who have experienced loss. There's a depth to those kind of people. I've learned so much from them. So I always say to myself, don't be afraid. Or I always say to myself, yeah, I say that to me too, but to everybody, <laughs> don't be afraid to hear somebody's grief. Do not be afraid of the emotion that they're going to show you because yeah. emotion is scary. We're taught, you know, don't show those emotions. That's another teaching, right? Yeah. Um, don't be afraid because what's going to happen is not only are you going to have a better understanding, you're going to feel deeply connected to your own loved ones that have crossed over, even if you don't even talk about spirit. Yes. Because we are human beings. We need connection. And grief is internal. If somebody says, I'm not ready to talk about it, that's okay. You know, in grief, it's a very internal process. Um, yeah. And people say, oh, I don't want to bring it up. They don't want to. Listen, somebody who's grieving, if they don't want to talk about it, they will tell you. They may not be able to say, I need to talk about it, but they darn well will tell you, <laughs> you know, at the risk of saying, you know, shut up. I don't want to hear it. Or they will, you will know when somebody doesn't want to talk about it. Absolutely. It's getting people to talk about it and being willing to listen because most people in grief don't talk about it because we feel like people don't want to listen. We feel like a burden. Yeah. Shirley is actually saying, letting us tell the story over and over is the biggest gift. So I just wanted to add that in there because it's just reiterating what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the thing is, is every time we tell it over and over, we are actually processing a different piece of it, which allows more healing to come in and more understanding. That's why I wrote, so my first book that I wrote, um, Love You Have a Baby, Baby, literally is the story of my daughter's life mm -hmm. and death, all the aftermath and my experiences with grief, um, all the, all the, all the dirty secrets. I, I just laid it all out there because it's true. Yeah. Um, but it also includes in it, I also told the story of how she came through in spirit and what that looked like and what that journey was like. And that process of writing that book was so cathartic. I was able to acknowledge things that I had shame about, that I had guilt about, that I hadn't even considered. And to be able to put it out on paper and tell that story and voice it yes. allowed me to process it. So when you say you have um, clients that are wanting to write their books, oh my gosh, please. Oh, I know. That's what I say to them too. Yes. Please, please, please. Write your stories. Like the stories of grief, it interconnects all of us. Um, if you feel a certain way, share it. And that's really for the grief side, but for people supporting somebody in grief, back to the topic, <laughs> I got sidetracked. Um, okay. Yeah, we go back to that concept of how to support somebody in grief. Um, be willing to listen and allow yourself to not need to fix it. We're very much um, human beings that feel like, oh, I need to fix that. And we realize we can't fix it. And that's what makes us hard for us to support somebody in grief. Even me, sometimes I have to check myself um, when somebody who's close to me is grieving. And I have to remind myself, 
you need to just listen. You need to encompass them. You need to reach out to them. Um, a mo one of the most touching things someone ever did for me was um, every year on my daughter's birthday, I would receive flowers. There's actually a couple of people that did this. I would receive a card and flowers. Saying our loved one's names, yeah. we need you to do that because it validates that their life touched yours, that their, vi their life was important and that you recognize that they're still a part of our life, even though they've transitioned. So just acknowledging them as time goes on, I feel like um, in the people who are supporting those who are grieving, we feel like maybe we shouldn't say the name because we don't want to bring up things. Mm. Please say their names. Please acknowledge them. Please give me the opportunity to talk about my loved one. Um, that is, it, it's so, it's profoundly helping and healing. Because just because you don't see my child beside me and she's not in school with your, with your children does not mean that she's not alive. It yes. does not mean that she's not as valuable. It does not mean that I do not think about her every single day. And in grief, we tend to, if we don't see it, then we go our own way. So supporting yeah. them is just acknowledging their loved one, um, listening when they need it, um, offering support. They may not take you up on it. I'll tell you that sometimes bereaved people have a hard time reaching out for support. Yes. They feel like they're drowning. They feel like a burden. Um, sometimes just getting out of bed is literally a monumental feat, something to be celebrated in all honesty. Yeah. Um, so and I think, sorry for interrupting. I think when we say to people, if there's anything you need, just let me know. Sometimes you almost need to be that person to go, so I'm bringing over supper at five o'clock. Yes. Do you prefer this or this? Yes. So then it's kind of taking that away from them to ask for help and going, I'm going to help you no matter what here's your choices, you know? Absolutely. And, and I feel like people who are supporting someone who is deep in grief, having the awareness of what to do makes all the difference in the world because when they know it, they can talk about it and they should take the lead rather than backing off. Um, wow. Like imagine if everyone in the whole world understood that this is how we support somebody in grief or can support someone in grief when they're ready for it. Yeah. Wow. Like the ripple effect of that is tremendous on so many levels. When I think about all the people carrying around grief and how I carried around grief, I do not know how people do it for their whole life. It literally came this close to killing me, which yeah. means my children lost out. Um, which means my whole family lost out. Um, it affects everyone. It's such a huge topic. I'm so happy to be here talking about it, Catherine, just to give people awareness, either to validate for bereaved or to give those supporting them awareness. It's yeah. so, it's so, it's so dear to my heart, clearly. <laughs> I, I love your passion for it and the amount of raw emotion that you're willing to put into it as well. It's, it's beautiful. Now, I do want to ask what, um are the three key ways to connecting with your loved ones on the other side All right uh so i usually set this up your first one is your imagination okay so everybody so, so I, I heard this all the time that's all in your imagination nobody saw it or that girl's got a big imagination so when we go through our daily life our imagination when we're a child can sometimes be encouraged or discouraged but as you come into adulthood, we're discouraged to imagine. We get, it's like you move into adult mode and it's like, get a job, do the responsible thing. Do you have savings? Um, if you shouldn't be out traveling, you have kids, you don't need a vacation. And all these things are suddenly layered on top of us. We don't imagine anymore. So when you think about it, everything, the chair I'm sitting on, the desk I'm sitting at, Apple, iPad, those people chose to imagine. It doesn't mean they knew all the steps to get there, but they imagined this thing in their head that could be that didn't exist. Now imagine that nobody did that and the internet wasn't created and we didn't go to space and all that jazz. We were required imagination to do that. Yes. So people often say, you know, when I connect, um, clairvoyance for me is literally projected through 
my vision, but that's in my imagination. It's in my mind, I guess you could say. And a lot of people discredit that. They get a lot of people have clairvoyance where they're seeing in their mind using their imagination or they hear thoughts when they're hearing some people think oh it should be like you and me talking right now i hear it and some people do it, it, it's profound and i wish i had it like that but i don't and that's why it took me so long to hone my claire audience because i thought it should be like that person over there and yes. it's just like it's exciting but it's not it starts off as this well i shouldn't say it starts off as soft and subtle um, because sometimes it's like spirits yelling at me. The thoughts are like, hello, <laughs> can we get back to this? But that tool is being able to um, recognize if I'm allowing my thoughts to come in, that's how spirit, that's how I talk. I'm channeling through the thoughts that are dropping in that technically are not mine. It's yeah. not me, little Erin over here who thinks she knows everything. They channel and come through. I couldn't come up with that kind of wisdom. Oh no, not little old me. <laughs> For yeah. sure, no. Um, so your imagination. So that is huge. If you can get over that hurdle and that concept of it's in my imagination, you're you're golden. Like you're going to be smooth sailing. Yeah. Um, one of the other keys that I also say is the compound interest. That's one of them. Yes. So the compound interest is um, if you are willing to devote 10 minutes a day, That that is a golden ticket right there. So that's the other thing. The third thing is, it's actually interesting because a lot of people um, think, is that really one of the keys? But it actually is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the third key is um, what you believe. Mm. It doesn't matter if you use your imagination and it doesn't matter um, how many times you go through doing things over and over. If you are not willing to believe even if it's just 1%. So you can have, if we're at 50, 50, you just need that extra 1% of belief. You yeah. really do. Because if you're constantly going to, well, I don't really believe, or that's not really possible, then it's not for you. It's not possible. That's all there is to it. You yeah. define your experience. You either expand it or you limit it. And your beliefs are one of the keys to opening up to spirit. Um, and when I actually think about it, people often think they're coming to me to learn to just to connect with their child or their spouse or whatever. And at the end of it, they say, wow, you know, that was not just about learning to connect. That was opening up all the things from my past, <laughs> opening up things that I believe that are not true, because that is what happens. It's, you know, it's huge. It's so much huger than I could ever have imagined yes. or even conceived of. Uh, and it's beautiful. And absolutely, those are my three keys. And often people are they're like belief. Oh, come on, that's a key. It really is when you think about it. <laughs> absolutely, because there's the belief in yourself yeah. that what you're actually getting is real, yeah. and then yeah. there's belief that there's actually something that exists. Because even, and I know for myself doing this kind of work, there's times where I'll get stuff, and then afterwards I'm like, I can't believe how good that was. Yeah. And my husband has said to me, I don't know how many times you do realize this is what you do for a job, right? That's how I feel too. It's like, woo, mind blowing. Yes. <laughs> and it's so funny that as much as we believe it, we can still see that there still is a little bit of disbelief yes. that it could possibly be true, that it could just be this miraculous that we're able to experience mm -hmm. certain stuff. Now, I know you have a workshop that's coming up. Yes, I do. Yeah. It's actually um, learning the communication. It's experiential. So it's learn to communicate with your loved one. Uh, so Beautiful. basically what that's on the 30th, actually, that's coming up soon. Very and, soon. Yes. Yeah. Time is flying. <laughs> <laughs> Going on the time space continuum. So the workshop is actually a brief evening workshop where I actually lead you through more in depth of what those keys are and what they look like. And um, just drilling down into the basis of them to help people to do that and learn. And then we go through an actual guided experience where I'm going to guide them with my guides. Spirit comes in, they have their own connection. And then we go through their connections so that we can validate each other's and open that up. Because when we go in a group of people, that energy is amplified. 
you and I talking amplifies the energy. Yeah. Um, when you get into a group of people who come together to connect, I am always, it's like shock and awe afterwards. It, it's mind blowing. I think, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. And it never fails. It's like spirits got your back. And, yeah. you know, for a lot of people, um, when I first started, like I had hesitation doing workshops and things like that because it was like, yeah. And it wasn't until, you know, I started taking them that I realized that if, if spirit can tell me all they want to and give me signs to do different things, but it's not going to matter if I don't actually take the step to do something, yes. you know, and that was a hurdle for me too, when I first started out. And then when I started doing things, I was like, why did I wait so long? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's actually coming up on October the 30th. Awesome. Uh, I do limit spaces. There are some spaces left. Okay. You can definitely anybody that wants to do it can go to my website and sign up for that. I can't put a link in Zoom, but I'm sure I can flip over a link on the Facebook Live app. I'm just grabbing it right now. Um, and I'm going to put it into the comment section. Now, one more question for you, because we have run out of time. And this is a question that I ask everybody that's on the in the spotlight. If you could share one piece of wisdom with the world, for the world to hear right now, what would you want the world to know? Hmm. That you all matter. And you're all loved. And you're all surrounded. And there's nothing that spirit won't do to let you know that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I want to cry too. <laughs> the crying medium, that's me. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> My kids will like, look at me, we're watching a movie, we're watching a commercial, it starts to get emotional or whatever. And they all turn their heads and start looking to see like three, two, one, and there's the two. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what it is guys <laughs> thank you so much for joining me here tonight Erin I think you really really just kind of opened up so much awareness for so many people and to help them with their own grief of whatever that looks like so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and for sharing your beautiful gift with all of us um, for anybody who is interested in booking a private reading with Erin uh, you guys can go over to her website at www.erinchandler.com um, on Facebook she's at there is life after losing a child and on Instagram. She's the grief spirit connection. So all of those are in the comment section of this video. And thank you again, Erin, for joining us. And I hope you'll all join us next week. We have Efi Anastasia joining us and she's going to be talking to us about really honoring our gifts within ourselves. So thanks everyone and have a great night. Bye. Thank you.